I was just thinking about this the other day, which is you know, one of the big races here in Australia is called Gob of the Liverpool. It's 180 kilometres and it's a, it's a pretty torrid race back in the day. And I remember when I entered it the first time, I, I figured that I'd probably be counting each of those kilometres off. Such was the pain that I expected wow. uh, during that race. And and over time, you actually get a sense that uh, through training, you, you're up to it and the kilometres fly by. In, in road cycling, we have a bit of a code, which is you only push your pedals hard when you have to. Mm -hmm. And when you have to, you push them as hard as you possibly can. Welcome to Push To Be More with me, your host, Matt Edmondson. This is a show that talks about the stuff that makes life work. And to help us do just that, I am chatting with today's special guest, all the way from the other side of the world, Andrew Kelly from the Antarctic Science Foundation. We are gonna be talking about the unsexy wisdom of just turning up amongst other things it's going to be fun now the show notes and transcript from our conversation will be available on our website push to be more.com and also whilst you're there you can sign up for our newsletter and each week i will email you the links from today's show the notes the transcripts they all just appear automatically direct to your inbox totally free which is all amazing. So make sure you sign up to the newsletter. Now this episode is brought to you by Orion Media, which helps entrepreneurs and business leaders set up and run their own successful podcast. You know what? I have found running my own podcast to be really rewarding. It's why I now have three of them. Oh yes, uh, podcasting opens doors to amazing people, just like Andrew, like nothing else I've seen. I have built networks, I have made friends, I've traveled the world and visited podcast guests, uh, and I've had a platform to champion my customers, my teams, my suppliers. It's just, honestly, the list of benefits is horrendous. Uh, and I think just about any entrepreneur or business leader should have a podcast because of the huge impact I've seen it have on my own business. Now, of course, this sounds great in theory, but in reality, there's the whole problem of setting up distribution, getting the tech right, knowing what the right podcast strategy is, the social media, the blood, the list goes on. You see, I love talking to people, but I do not enjoy all that other stuff. So Orion Media takes it all off my plate. I do what I'm good at and they brilliantly take care of the rest. So if you're wondering if podcasting is a good marketing strategy for your business, check it out. Check out uh, orionmedia.com. That's A-U-R-I-O-N media.com. And we will, of course, link to them in the podcast show notes too, which hopefully by now you are subscribed to on the email. And if you're not, go to pushtobemore.com and sign up to that, find out more about Orion Media, and get podcasting yourself. Now, before I get into today's conversation with Andrew, I wanna give a bit of a shout out and thank you to Simon O'Shaughnessy, who actually connected my good self and Andrew. Uh, Simon, uh, who we used to call, well, I still call actually, is uh, Aslan. He used to have bright, I don't know if you ever knew Simon and Andrew when he had red hair and a red beard. So we called him Aslan. It's all white now. Uh, but Simon is great at coaching and just a lovely guy. In fact, he's coming on the show soon, so do stay connected uh, with what's going on. Now, Andrew started started his career with eight years in banking and at the same time competed at an elite level in road cycling. Oh yes, not an easy sport. And it was here that Andrew learned the importance of preparing for racing, training, visualization, strategy, analysis, persistence, tenacity, determination, accountability, all the buzzwords of course. And uh, what we're talking about today, the unsexy wisdom behind this idea of just keep turning up. Andrew went on to build and sell his own advertising business before heading to the third sector, captivated with the idea of doing good in society. Across two decades, he has witnessed the power of generosity by, facil by facilitating transformational gifts to check these out, Youth Off The Streets, The Smith Family, The Refuge Advice and Casework Service, The Society of St. Vincent de Paul and Children's Medical Research Institute. And if that's not enough, 
Andrew is now the CEO of the awesome Antarctic Science Foundation, which connects, uh, which creates connections between philanthropists and researchers to enable catalytic scientific research on the icy continent. And he is an observer, an observer with a capital O, which obviously is a title, on the Australian Antarctic Science Council. He cycles still around 300 kilometers a week, which I just think is nuts. I rarely drive that far, let alone cycle that far. Uh, he plays the piano and guitar, reads lots of books, but his favorite uh, self-proclaimed role is, or his self-proclaimed favorite role, actually, I should word it slightly differently, is simply being a dad. Andrew, welcome to uh, Push To Be More. It's great to have you here. Thank you for joining me all the way from the other side of the world. How are we doing? Thanks, Matt. It's terrific to be with you. Thank you for the invitation. Oh, no, it's great. Glad you turned up. Now, I, I'm assuming you didn't have to cycle anywhere to get to the uh, interview. No, no, I'm I'm well ensconced at home now, uh, on uh, on Monday evening. Yeah, it's funny, isn't it, with the time zones and how that works. So it's Monday morning for me. It's Monday evening for you, uh, and you are based in Sydney, Australia, right? That's right. Uh, local boy, grew up here. Always lived in Sydney, uh, with some secondments to to New York, and also to uh, living in France when I was cycling. Yeah, yeah. So tell me about this, right? The cycling thing. Um, how did you get into that? Was just that you just, when you were a kid, your dad bought you a BMX and you got hooked or how did that work? Actually, it, it's, it sounds strange because it's from another age, but we used to have this program here in Australia called Wide World of Sports. It was on, mm. in the, on a Saturday afternoon and they used to cut up bits of the Tour de France and spread it across the the whole afternoon, you know, the previous week's stages. And I'd sit there and watch these little three and four minute segments and sort of piece together the Tour de France over, over uh, you know, three weeks, four weeks, and these highlights. And it just seemed like an activity from not the other side of the world, but from another world. We didn't have yeah. internet. Uh, we didn't have high definition TV. And so we got these glimpses of this amazing sport. Uh, and, and I thought I, I want to try that. And, and so I got a bike and I started hearing around on it. And, and then I realized it's, it's really hard. Um, <laughs> I went to a club, club race and started club racing and, and realized after a little while that the, you know, at the top level, it's it's really hard, and mm. and the the romance of it um, leaves um, stage left pretty quickly, and and so I just focused on that, um, figured that I could be okay at it, and and really experimented quite a bit with with my mind and my body, um, training it and seeing how far I could go. The <laughs> So, and you're doing this, uh, what, when you're a teenager? Yeah, uh, I was, yeah, I was a teenager. I started off when I was about 13, 14. And uh, that's it. That's junior level. Uh, and, and then got to seniors when I was 18 uh, while I was doing school. And then in my early career, when I was in banking, I was, um, I was actually in overnight markets. So European, US markets. Uh, working overnight and training during the day uh, to to see how far I could take it. <laughs> so you were training during the day and you were doing this sort of, uh, I, I, I never really thought about people working night shifts in banking, but I suppose it makes sense with the worldwide market, right? Um, and so you're, you're working nights and you're training during the day to see how far it gets. So how far did you actually manage to get with the, the cycling thing? Yeah, so I, I raced here in Australia at an elite level and then went over to Europe in 93 and on an international license, uh, an amateur license, uh, that's how we were classified back then, mm -hmm. uh, entered international races uh, with the hope of turning pro uh, and getting uh, scavenging, if you like, uh, domestic rides with uh, development squads that had 
uh, pathways into the European pro teams. So I, I spent a season in Europe in 93 racing and they said, come back and win a Commonwealth Games or do well at a, at a national level and then come back in uh, 90, 95. So I would have been, you know, in my mid Get, getting to my mid twenties by then, mm. which was the normal time for uh, riders to turn pro. Uh, what happened in between was um, everybody turned pro under the new the new system in ninety four when uh, pros were allowed to go to the Olympics, and so mm-hmm. amateurism was basically uh, stamped out. and And I also had a burst appendix, so. On the eve of going back to Europe in '95, I had a, a burst appendix. Oh wow! Almost killed me, and uh, and and that that took, put paid to to cycling. Uh, the cycling world changed. Um, it took me quite a while to recover from that. And you know, in some respects, if I had continued on, I would have gone into the probably the Lance Armstrong era, which have, was obviously one of the the less glorious um, periods of, of pro yeah. cycling. So. In some respects, the the path diverged, and though it wasn't pleasant at the time, uh, I'm I'm pretty pleased with the way things have worked out. Yeah, it's funny how that works, isn't it? it, it the, the amount of people that you talk to uh, about stuff that happened, and there's always this sort of I don't want to use the word calamity, but there's a, there's something that happens which derails a, a a path that you think you should be on. And then the, the path that you end up on seems to be a, a, a better fit. It's almost fortuitous in some ways. But you, um, I don't know whether, I, I, I mean, I'm not saying that, you know, destiny did this, but I'm, I think people make the best of the, the road that they're on, don't they? And they, they can sort of find a New Zealand passion on that road. Is that what happened to you? Absolutely. I, I, I agree that it, it's not fate and it's, it's, not, it's not some sort of predestiny. I, I don't believe in that. But it's it's interesting to run the counterfactuals of, wow, if I'd gone that way, these things might have happened. Uh, also, I think that when you're, in my case, a young man in my early 20s, I wanted to be a pro cyclist. I wasn't really thinking of what it might be like to be a husband or a father or uh, a family man or, or to have a profession outside of cycling. So there's there's that wisdom that's not... Uh, existent in in a younger person which with a few years and a few scrapes you you start to accumulate that mm. uh, and then you can see uh, how valid and also how limiting some of your earlier thoughts or, or dreams or ideas or projects might have been that's interesting that's interesting so um so the path that you end up going down after cycling we mentioned in the introduction i mean one of the things that you know we've talked about uh, before hitting the record button, obviously, um, is how the the cycling, the lessons that you learned there, um, really impacted then how you approached this sort of new path that you were on. Um, what were some of the things that you sort of, you know, we call the show Push to Be More, but I'm always curious where people have had to sort of push and overcome things. So here you are, uh, you know, a young man cycling. There's, I'm sure there's a lot of lessons there where you've had to overcome, right? Yeah, so the, the first thing about um, road cycling particularly, I was just thinking about this the other day, which is you know, one of the big races here in Australia, it's called Goblet to Liverpool. It's 180 kilometres and it's a, it's a pretty torrid race back in the day. And I remember when I entered it the first time, I, I figured that I'd probably be counting each of those kilometres off, such was the pain that I expected wow. uh, during that race. And... And over time, you actually get a sense that uh, through training, you, you're up to it and the kilometres fly by. In, in road cycling, we have a, a bit of a code, which is you only push your pedals hard when you have to. Mm-hmm. And when you have to, you push them as hard as you possibly can. And so that's that whole notion of you've got to conserve energy uh, mm during a race that's as long as that, and especially when those races are back-to-back like the Tour de France and big stage races. And then when you are called upon or you call upon yourself to, to make that supreme effort, it has to be 
absolutely all out. So that that's a, a bit of a, a motto that I've carried through my life as well. Yeah. But the the big one, I suppose, is that notion you talked about, which is just keep turning up, and and that was a that was a really formative moment in my life. Uh, I was late to training one day, and again, this is back in the day when we didn't have mobile phones. We just met at a particular corner at five thirty in the morning, which was a bit of a hike from where I lived. Uh, it was about seventeen kilometres, so I had to get on the <laughs> on the bunny pretty pretty early to, to mm. meet the training training group. And one day I was late, and I if you're late, you just have to chase on. So I chased on, and I was pretty good at time trialing and catching catching up the road, uh, caught the group. We did the training session and we got back to where we, where we used to, um, split up. And my coach said to me, you were late to training this morning. And I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and sort of just brushed it off. <clears throat> and he said, you know, Andrew, <clears throat> um, everything you get out of life is what you put in. You've got mm. to put in before can expect anybody else to to help you um and he says the great secret in life is to just he says because if you turn up to training on time then the the rest of the bunch to some extent is going to do the training for you you're in the bunch and and you'll get the benefit he says and then there'll be a race meeting out in the country where it's rained for a week and a whole bunch of people who were going to go to that race, that road race, they won't go. They'll stay at home instead of venturing into the country, knowing it's going to be a yeah. really wet, a wet parkour. And then on the morning of the race, people will look outside the hotel and they'll say, oh, it's been raining overnight. And so they'll stay in the hotel rather than turn up to the, to the start line. But you turn up to the start line and then... The race starts off, it's rain, it rains for the first two hours and a whole bunch of riders just peel off and jump into the team cars. You stay in the race, you just turn up and stay in the race. And then a break goes away and you just turn up into that break, a break you've got no business being in. But given the conditions and given the, the mindset of those around you, you get into the break. And then you'll be seven kilometres from home and there'll be a rise in the road. Everyone's looking at each other. It's been a really hard day and you go away. You just turn up when there's that opportunity and you end up winning a race that you had no business winning. Mm. Uh, and it's simply because of the cumulative effect of turning up. And and that's a message that Robert, my coach, uh, you know, he still rides his bike. Um, even in, you know, he's really pushing on and he's had m enormous health problems. Um, but that's a message that I've taken out of cycling mm. and into everything else that I do. And it's that cumulative effort uh, of just turning up, putting in the effort each day, which which builds a career and, and it also uh, builds connections, it builds wisdom, uh, and it's the most valuable thing I've ever been told. That's really powerful. It's really powerful, isn't it? The power of just keep turning up. I mean, it's, it's you know, we'd say in, when it comes to things like social media, the, the way you win in social media is consistency, right? It's just the, you just keep turning up. Um, you do something of value, obviously, you don't turn up with drivel, but you, you do something of value and you just keep turning up. And eventually you win because everybody else drops out. And it's a really interesting one, isn't it? That... Um, <clears throat> That here you are on the bikes learning the same lesson that actually everyone just drops out. The same in e-commerce, you know, when the, 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 the businesses that we, we're involved with, people just drop out all the time. And it's the ones who deliver something of value consistently uh, over time. I, I, I love that. The unsexy wisdom of just keep turning up because it's not something uh, that people want to hear usually these days. I don't know if, it, if you, whether it's just me that, thinks that Andrew or whether you've noticed this as well there is a sort of a I don't want to hear that I want the sort of the latest technique or silver bullet or something you go well it's just keep turning up and you're like well no 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 surely I need to no, yeah you just keep turning up uh it's it's a really I uh, what do you find actually when you talk to people about this I'm curious do they do they roll their eyes or do they go oh okay 
I think intuitively we know it's true. Um, mm. At the same time, if you switch it into finance, people talk about the cumulative effects of bank interest, the compound interest, uh, and or reinvesting uh, mm. y- your dividends. So we know we know in an, in another arena that that it is absolutely the cornerstone of of success. Yes, we would like a hack. Yes, we would like that nip and tuck, or but but it's never transformational and. I, I agree, you know, whether it's social media or any, any domain, it's those who have the track record of um, turning up, doing the work um, and, and building your craft. That's the other, mm. that's the other piece. You know, the, I often say, you know, the, there's only one question you ask a surgeon when you're going into hospital for an operation, which is how many times have you done the surgery? <laughs> if he says, I'm really excited to do it for the first time, you know, you want to run and don't look back. Yeah. Uh, so, so that's what you're looking for when you put your life in somebody else's hands. So uh, I just figure it's probably a good, a good uh, approach in, in anything that's worthwhile doing. It's interesting, isn't it? Because my, my brain functions slightly differently uh, at this juncture because I'm like, yes, I don't want the surgeon doing it for the first time, but my the flip side of that would be, well, if he's done it a thousand times, how's he not got complacent? Because I, 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 I find actually the, the, this is what separates the, the craftsman just from people who are really, they're okay at something, is the craftsmen don't get complacent. They're always trying to look at how to, how to improve or how to make it better. Whereas the complacent guys go, well, I know what I'm doing. It's fine. It'll be all right. Um, and I'm I, outside of work, I do a lot of joinery, woodwork type stuff. I just love making stuff out of wood with my hands. And um, I learned this lesson when I put my hand through a table saw, uh, just being complacent. Uh, and you kind of think, well, yeah, how do you how do you stop that complacency? How do you how do you keep building your craft? Curiosity. Uh, I think that curiosity is the something that's driven me on. Uh, I'm, I'm always interested in meeting other people, mm. uh, hearing other views, uh, reading and absorbing uh, information and knowledge. So curiosity is a, is a terrific um, quality. And in the case of your surgeon, yeah, you want, you want to see somebody who is um, staying on top of their game and, and wanting to improve and keep up to date. And, and they're pretty easy to spot uh, if you can ask them a, a question about, you know, what the current uh, trend is or the, or the latest technique uh, in any field. And I find that really interesting, just talking to people in different fields to understand their craft, mm. how they keep up to date, what led them to do that craft and, and what keeps them curious. Yeah, I like that. The power of curiosity uh just the the ability to ask questions i think it's one of those things that they don't teach you at school or at university and actually if you if you were to distill the success of people down to several you'd say well a big part of my success maybe was look i was in the right place at the right time or i saw an opportunity i took advantage of it but one of the things that i think is probably quite true that people don't really mention is I think I'm successful because I've learned how to ask questions along the way. And I, and for some reason, I asked the right question at the right time to the right person, which opened the right door. And you kind of, you, 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 you get kind of intrigued by this, don't you? The, the ability to ask questions and the ability to be curious is one of those things which makes us distinctly human. But somehow I think in the advent of, maybe it's social media again, I don't know if you've got any thoughts on this, Andrew. We, because so much information is given to us, we seem to have lost the ability to ask questions of people. I don't know. Yeah, that, that that's really interesting. So, so the curious mind uh, is is in real trouble when you start getting into into social media or a, 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 an enormous vat of information like the internet. And and what I've come up with is uh, through reading and listening to people is that the the real skill on top of the curiosity is relevance realization. Looking at something and understanding, is that relevant to me? 
can I make that relevant to a situation uh, that I'm in or I might be in? So it's collecting information, not just as trivia, mm. but it's information, techniques, approaches, mindsets uh, through a relevance realization lens, uh, which actually narrows down what you're looking for. Uh, and and I think that that'll probably become one of the skills that is is really in demand uh, and, and will be, um, you know, the 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 dis, uh, I suppose the distinguishing uh, talent or skill of of people who can who can navigate all of that information because we've just got too much of it at the moment, mm. much more than we ever had. Yeah, yeah. No, it's very true, isn't it? That um, I like that. Uh, very clever. Very clever. Are you a are you a learned man? As in, do you do you read a lot? Yeah, when I'm when I'm not walking or working, I'm I'm reading. I I, I read an enormous amount, and mm. it's yeah, it's one of the life's great pleasures. And again, it's that uh, curiosity and um, testing my views and my opinions or my ideas against those of, of others. And I think it's one of the the great great pleasures and and. And the great tech, human technologies is to have another person's opinion on a piece of paper mm. and to have that person convey that to you and then to be in some really it's in communion with that other person uh, where you're trying to understand them and they're also trying to understand you not knowing that you even exist or that you'll be there at the other end of the writing yeah so yeah reading is is tremendous and and novels i i think are the are the most understated and, and probably the most countercultural and subversive art form that there is because mm. it's somebody putting an idea, a story, uh, the machinations of relationships into your brain, mm. uh, which I find endlessly fascinating. I have enormous amounts of uh, admiration for people who can write that well. Yeah. yeah, you and me both. I've tried it on the odd occasion and I just come away going, how in the world? You know, I've just, the, it's just, I, I, I totally agree, right? I, but I think it's interesting with novels, isn't it? Because there's something quite powerful that I've not been able to articulate yet, but there's something quite powerful at the end of the day, just to pick up a novel and read it. You kind of disassociate with, every, you suspend reality is maybe a better, and you get drawn into this story, which in your head is not real, but you're so engrossed in it. Uh, and I find it a remarkable way just to sort of switch off and 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 just relax and recharge is just to read a novel, you know. And I'm I'm I I just reread. Um, I should I don't know whether I should admit this or not. I just reread all the Jack Reacher novels by Lee Child, right? So I know there's a new one just come out, which I'm saving for a Christmas present. Uh, but I so I reread all like 20 million novels that you know Lee Child has written beforehand. But there's just something about getting drawn into it, and then you watch the TV show on Amazon, and you go, well, it's close to the book, but it's not quite the book, is it? And uh, and the, the, so there, there is something quite powerful, quite magical, like you say about a novel. Yeah, the the suspension of disbelief that you're reading letters off a page and you're feeding this imagination in your mind when every other uh, absorption technique that we have has been improved enormously. We now have super high definition televisions and, mm. and cinema screens. We, we have... Uh, better and better fidelity headphones and, and speakers to listen to music and watch watch cinemas, but we're still there with uh, you know the the, the novel printed mm. by Penguin or Faber and Faber. It's just letters on a page, and we suspend disbelief that we're we're reading this ink off a page, but in fact we're having this amazing imaginative uh, process take place in our in our mind and. And, and we're participating. That's the other thing. Where uh, you see a, something on Netflix or the cinema, it's being done to you mm. uh, in in almost every sense. Whereas with with reading, it's it's hard yakka. There's a there's a real effort that's uh, required. 
you don't build up momentum when you're reading, except mm. if you're drawn into the story, as you've said, with with the novel. So, so reading is hard, and uh, and writing in an age where reading is getting harder is is a real skill. Mm. Yeah, it is. It is. I like that. So, reading. I mean, my son would listen to. Do you listen to audio books? Uh, you know, I, I. My son listens to novels as opposed to. Well, one of my sons listens to novels. The other son likes to read them. Um, both of which require you to sort of imagine the scenes, right? Sure, the writer is painting the scene with some words on the page, but it's very incomplete. Whereas Netflix is very complete. There's no room for imagination because CGI now everything is so pristine. Uh, you don't have to think, you can take your brain out of the box and watch the program. Whereas, like you say, with a book or an audio book, you have to get involved and you have to imagine scenes, don't you? And build these things in your in your mind. Very good. I, we could wax lyrical about that. It's always nice, actually, to find uh, people who, like me, at the end of the day, just like to sit and read a novel and just enjoy the novel for the novel's sake. Um, I think it's a great way to sort of unwind at the end of the day. So. So you do you read business books as well, or is it just predominantly novels? I, I do read right across genres, uh, and and certainly, uh, you know, there's some there's some really good books uh, in, around economics or cognitive psychology and 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 behaviour. Um, you know, Thinking Fast and Slow is a is a tremendous book by Kahneman, mm-hmm. uh, which is pretty influential. Um, I also like um, Benoit Mandelbrot wrote some great books about chaos. You know, he's the godfather of chaos, chaos theory, and his applications to human behaviour and also to markets is is pretty interesting. I like Nassim Taleb uh, and his work around black swans and, and being fooled by randomness. That that whole series is excellent, and it's very countercultural. Uh, so, uh, you know, that that would be the uh, the extent of, of business related books that I've read mm. and, and there's, there's trading books and, and the like, but I also like science and history and um, maths and poetry. So it's, it's a, it's a pretty broad range of books and I'm a bit promiscuous. I, I, I have lots of books on the run at any one time. I really mm. try hard to, to keep it down to, to a few at, uh, going, but I, I inevitably, run off and have an affair with a with a <laughs> <laughs> you know what we're so similar Andrew uh, I said to my wife said to me uh, my wife and my daughter and I were sat around the table uh, and Zoe my daughter was like what do you want for Christmas dad I said all oh, this these books that I've been recommended and Sharon's like you don't need more books you've got 20 books by the side of the bed you've got four <laughs> books on your Kindle which you're reading right you don't need any more books I'm like I definitely need more books <laughs> It's just funny. Yeah. There's just something quite lush about it. Well, I think I don't know if it was Umberto Eco or I think it was. He said you should have, and and certainly Nassim Taleb. So I may confuse the reference, but one or other or both of them said you should have the biggest library that your financial means can mm. can sustain. And it's a it's a constant reminder of that which you don't know, mm. and that you have access to, and so. Whether it's uh, you don't know the end of the, the particular novel series that you're on, or you don't know a particular um, the history of a particular country or region, it's it's a good uh, it's a good provocation to have information around you that possibly you might not get through in a lifetime, but it's there and mm. it's it's whispering that that you don't know everything, and I mm. think that that's a that's a good. Um, well, I, f- I find it healthy. Yeah, well, it drives curiosity, doesn't it? Going back to to what you said, you know, it, dr- it drives that curiosity ideal. You said on your um, LinkedIn bio, two great tasks of my life have been learning how to think and being in the service of others, which I thought was a really interesting quote, right? So the, the two uh, two things that they don't really sort of teach you necessarily at school, um, but sort of this idea of the two great tasks, learning how to think, and so this again is highlighted by your love of reading, your sort of and your curiosity, your thirst for knowledge. Was that something that you've always had, or is that something that you consciously developed later in life? I think early on, I got a sense that 
you know, we have this amazing, amazing mind that's given to us. And I read uh, Edward de Bono's Six Thinking Hats really Perfect. early yeah. in, yeah. Uh, I think I was a teenager when I read that. Mm. Um, I think my dad gave that to me. And and also uh, towards the end of school and into university, read uh, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, which is just a brilliant book, which I read, I reread every 10 years mm -hmm. uh, out of school. And knowing how powerful our minds are, but also how prone we are to, to biases and, and easy thinking, mm -hmm. uh, really makes me curious about how, how to best approach situations, uh, with curiosity, with an open mind, rather than um, by rote and just using the same techniques every time. So one of the things that I do in situations is I ask myself, what would I have to believe for this to be right? And what would I have to believe for this to be wrong? Mm. And so I try to take that, you know, that uh, two-handed approach or uh, opposing views of a situation of a view uh of an opinion and and quite often that helps uncover uh blind spots uh that are just just out of the periphery uh of of, your, of my vision um so that's that's really in you know in, in in simple terms what what i've tried to do is is just avoid fooling myself uh, and and we we can be uh, we're we're all prone to mm. to fooling ourselves. We we can um, we can be as ourselves the best. Uh, you know, if you, if you can if you can do it to yourself, you can pretty much do it to anybody else. Mm. Uh, and so if you can if you can just um, step back and look at situations and and not participate in magical thinking that's that's another piece which is you know that somehow this will all work out mm. uh and just just bring a bit of rigor to it um and so that's that's led my curiosity into into that field and just understanding how i think yeah yeah it's interesting that um i, I as you were talking then i was reminded of the the book Jim Collins, Good to Great, and he talks about one of the things in there was the confrontation of the brutal facts, is what he called it. Um, and he was uh, he referenced Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning book. Uh, he talked about life in concentration camps. A phenomenal book if you ever get a chance to read it. And nice um, book. oh yeah, just eye opening. Um, and this whole idea of actually the, the magical thinking is what made me smile and think of this. Actually, is this this understanding that actually you can't do that. You have to confront the brutal facts, uh, and you have to, you know, do you know what I mean, be aware of them and 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 uh, and deal with those. So this is, um, you know, your your sort of desire to learn. You, you, the second part of that for, uh, statement you put on LinkedIn was in being in service of others, and there seemed to be a very distinct career switch for you where you went from sort of uh banking economics advertising all that sort of stuff into what you you call the third sector that do you mean where you've now been doing uh, that for a couple decades fundraising um raising in effect awareness and resources for some incredible charitable work right and you're now with um, the Antarctic Science Foundation. Tell us a little bit about that. What does the Antarctic Science Foundation do? It sounds really cool, by the way. Uh, to, you know, it's <laughs> probably the best job title ever. I am CEO of the Antarctic Science Foundation. It just sounds really cool. It's pretty amazing. Uh, so the Antarctic Science Foundation was set up to fund projects and, and very tenacious people to go south into the most Matt, inhospitable hardest environment you can possibly imagine i mean mm. one of the one of the great fibs of antarctica is you see these beautiful vistas of white and blue skies but the place is brutal when when the first explorers went down there you know 200 years ago they called it hell uh, no yeah. gps no email uh facing 200 meter cliff faces of ice, not knowing where they're going to park 
yeah. the the wooden ship that they've sailed away from from home and family on. And so the foundation backs people through our supporters, our, our amazing supporters, back these people to go south into this environment to to do the research which arguably will inform the future of life on this planet. Hmm. Antarctica is a, a huge repository of information. So uh, in, in the ice, in the in the species and animals that are down there, in, in the geology, uh, in the waters, it is information that we have never seen. And so I often describe Antarctica as the humanity's greatest library, but again, mm. we've barely read any of the books. And you can only get down there uh, you know, about five months of the year. Mm -hmm. The rest of the time, it's impassable. It's, it's easy to get people on and off the International Space Station most days of the year than it is to get them in and out of Antarctica. <laughs> and so of course it is. Of course it is. Yeah. yeah. So we're really dealing with the extreme of, of elements. Mm. And, and to be able to go down and do uh, ice cores, uh, to, to, to drill down into... Uh, these mountains of ice and take out cores which possess these ancient bubbles full of particles and gases which will tell us what the atmosphere and the environment was doing a million years, two million years ago is crucial for us to understand our moment in time compared to uh, that which has come before us mm. and for us to understand how we will build strategies and mitigation for the amount of carbon that we've emitted into into the atmosphere. And then, if you like, rep charge back to, to, to get that information and then put that into uh, strategies in society that will allow us to, to flourish. Mm. So that's the, that's the work of the foundation. Uh, we do it with the support of uh, amazing uh, supporters, philanthropists and donors, um, from the very big to to the to the mums and dads, mm. and ultimately, what we're looking for are, are those those answers uh, that will that will push us forward and allow uh, us to to flourish on this planet. That sounds fantastic. Is that what drew you to the Antarctic Science Foundation? And absolutely, Antarctica is the canary in the coal mine, if you like. Mm. Uh, it drives our our oceans. The circumpolar current in the Southern Ocean drives all of the oceans in the world. Uh, it drives. It is the engine room of of global climate and weather systems. Uh, it has a tremendous effect on us here in Australia, uh, but also right around the world. For uh, arguably. Uh, 150 million years, it's been taking uh, carbon and heat and returning uh, that to to the environment and cooling our planet. Mm. So there really is no greater touchstone uh, for our time and our moment as a as a human community than Antarctica. Uh, we have certainly influenced it. When we go and look in those ice cores. Uh, we can we can see the uh, the coal being burnt in Glasgow, Dublin, uh, Edinburgh, uh, in Newcastle Steelworks here in Australia, turning on and turning off. We can see leaded fuel turning on and turning off, and unleaded fuel coming in. So it's almost like CSI Antarctica. We can see the fingerprint oh. of human interaction, mm. and and it's that knowledge uh, which is absolutely unique to that environment. Which we need to, we need to grab, we need to discover, we need to put the best of the best minds onto it, uh, so that we can answer those questions, which are urgent. They're they're absolutely urgent, mm. uh, as we can see with the meetings that are occurring around the world uh, presently, uh, and Antarctica, uh, as I say, a Antarctica has has the answers. We just need to ask the questions. Yeah, uh, that's amazing. 
uh, I, I find the whole thing down there fascinating. I mean, I, I have to be honest, since connecting with you, I obviously understand a little bit more than what I did. So um, if you'd like to know more about the Antarctic Science Foundation, the work that's going on there, why it's so important, um, head over to ASF, Antarctic Science Foundation, dot AQ. Um, I don't know what the .aq stands, it's an unusual domain, uh, I, but I, 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 anyway, that is the domain, asf.aq. That's um, the, the domain for Antarctica. Is it? Well, there you go. I figured it, right. it must have been something like that. Uh, the uh, <laughs> I can't imagine there's that many people on Antarctica searching for Antarctica domains. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Matt.aq might actually still be available. Um, so you've been doing that for a couple of years, right? So um, here you are sitting in Sydney, which in my head is probably one of the warmest places on the planet, doing work in probably what is the coldest place on the planet. Um, and you, you've, you've been raising funds and awareness. You told me actually a story, uh, Andrew, which really intrigued me about a lady who came to the, the website and left a donation. I can't remember what it was like, 70 bucks. It was a small donation. You wrote to her. And she left the donation on behalf of somebody else. Do you know that? Do you remember the story that I'm talking about? Yeah. So uh, the there was a lady who uh, left the donation, and it was in honour of one of her great friends. And I sent a note, as I do for for new donations, and noticed that she was from the US and asked her, um, th firstly thanked her for the donation and asked her um, how she'd come to hear about the Antarctic Science Foundation. And she said, oh, uh, I, my best friend is, um, is a, a huge fan of Antarctica and I'm making this donation on, in honour of his 90th birthday, uh, which was in a few days' time. It turned out that he'd been in Operation Deep Freeze in the, the US program in the 50s. Mm. And such was the impact of his time in Antarctica uh, that he, I suppose, much like my cycling, has taken that experience and it has informed the rest of his life. And he still gives a, a, a learning in the community program at Oregon State University, even in his 90s and uses his experience in Antarctica as the cornerstone of, of that, that program that he still delivers. Mm. Fantastic. Fantastic how it all sort of brings all of this together. So as we sort of uh, finish out the show, I, I understand, I suppose, areas where you've had to push. I understand, you know, in terms of how you fill your tank, whether it's on your bike, reading a book, or just being around people um, and being intensely curious, what's your hope for the future, Andrew? What do you What do you want to be uh, involved? What do you see? What What do you want to grow into? What do you want to be more of? Those kind of questions. What 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 five, three, four, five years time? What are we What are we hoping for? Well, the th the thing I hope for most and and work for is is to have energy. Uh, I, I think that energy. Personal energy is is the the currency of getting anything done and, mm. and having a, a good life. And and you ask most people um, as they get older, they just say, "Oh, I just wish I had more energy." So uh, as I get older, I, I I really focus on that and and keep a close eye on it because um, I'm a dad, um, which is a young man's sport. They tell me, uh, so <laughs> I, I've got to I've got to keep up with my daughter and and be a you know vibrant dad and husband. Um, and and also to give as much as I can uh, in in my work. And mm. when you say three, four, five years time uh, for Antarctica and and for humanity, we are really facing some some serious questions over over the next uh, five to ten years. Uh, and and what we do in that time period will have um, serious knock on effects for the future. Uh, we can't do it individually. We're going to all have to do it together, and and that is as it should be. Mm. Uh, so I I'm focused personally on on making sure I've got the energy uh, to do the work, and uh, and then with that energy to be able to do it as best as I possibly can. No, mm. oh, fantastic. Outside of um, 
cycling and reading, uh, how, how do you maintain or build energy? What are some of your insider secrets? You've got to keep moving. So the, the exercise is, is crucial. And, and also, I think it's mindset as well. So making sure that um, I, I try not to fixate on, on things too much. That's, that's easier said than done. Uh, but trying to keep uh, that mental balance uh, where there's variation between doing the work, but also spending time reading, uh, spending time in conversation with uh, intelligent and attractive people like you, Matt. Uh, but... <laughs> Sorry, I shouldn't laugh. <laughs> but conversations are terrific. Yeah. Uh, a terrific energy builder. In fact, I think it's one of the one of the great ones because it's it's again it's that a sharing that communion between two or more people where you you're sharing ideas, you you're comparing experiences, um, letting curiosity run. Uh, and and I find that even when I'm at at my most tired, uh, a good conversation, I, I've always got energy for that. Yeah. No, true. It's very, very true. It's why when uh, you you see friends you've not seen for a while, you're quite happy to stay up until two o'clock in the morning just chatting away, and it just it's just a beautiful thing, right? Yeah, yeah. No, I've been absolutely, there. absolutely. So, Andrew, penultimate question. As you know, this show is sponsored by Orion Media, which specialises in helping. Uh, interesting, intelligent, and good-looking people like yourself uh, set up and run their own podcast. Maybe that's what we should call the show from now on. Uh, so um, you've obviously, you've been on a lot of podcasts, but let's assume you've got your own podcast, The Andrew Kelly Show. Uh, I'm really curious to know who your guests would be. Who would you want to have on the show? Are the people that have impacted your life or people that you think could have the best impact on what's going down in, on down in Antarctica? Who'd be on the show and why? Well, I mean, my my first top of the list would be my dad who passed away 20 years ago. If I could have anyone on the show, um, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, that, that's, a, that's a great question, Matt. There's, there's so many scientists that are doing great work that are uh, virtually unknown. Uh, any one of those scientists uh, to have on on a podcast would be fantastic. Uh, not only to give them a platform, but also to show uh, you know wider community uh, the the work that's being done mm. in um, in Antarctica in in all of our names. Uh, so yeah, certainly some of the some of the scientists that I work with who have uh, a tremendous sense of humour. An amazing sense of application, and again that tenaciousness that that um, sends them back down to the icy continent when mm. uh, it's it's a pretty tough pretty tough environment. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if there's a Netflix streaming service on Antarctica, so I, yeah, I, <laughs> it's one of those, <laughs> isn't it? It's one of those. I'm curious, why would you, if you don't mind me asking, why would you have your dad back on the show? Uh, he was, you know, Mark Twain said when I was when I was seventeen, I thought my dad was an idiot. When I was twenty five, I was amazed at how much he'd learned in eight years. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, it's brilliant! You know, and and I I, th I just look back at my dad and I'm just amazed at the wisdom that he had. Mm. Uh, you know, he he grew up in Nottingham. He was a he was a Nottingham boy. Uh, left school when he, at the age of, uh, you know, the equivalent of year six, um, and you know had had a, had businesses, raised a big family, um, and and I think that the quality that I I love most about him is that he was always open to good things happening. Mm. Uh, he never fretted about a car parking spot. Um, that one would always materialise because he always figured one would. Mm. Um, but he was open to having conversations. Um, he always he always encouraged us to ask people uh, how they'd been successful, how they'd done things, and that's been an amazing door opener for me. Just to know that 
you can drop an email to an author or or anybody and most of the time they they reply and and mm. the conversations that i've had with the great and the good is you know quite remarkable and i owe that to my dad fantastic fantastic i like your mark twain quote as well i'm gonna put that on a piece of paper and give it to my kids <laughs> <laughs> wonder if it will help them <laughs> <laughs> might help me i don't know uh andrew listen it's been a great conversation i've loved every minute how do people reach you how do they connect with you if they want to do that how do they find out more about the antarctic sands foundation all of that sort of stuff uh certainly connect with me on linkedin andrew j kelly uh you'll find me there uh on linkedin and as you said the antarctic science foundation website is asf.aq yeah definitely check those out uh, we will link to andrew's info in the show notes uh, which as i've said you can get it for free along with the transcript at push to be more.com or direct to your inbox if you've signed up for our newsletter uh, andrew thank you so much bud for joining me thoroughly enjoyed the conversation thank you for all the work that you do down in antarctica as well with the with the foundation Appreciate you looking out for us. And um, honestly, mate, it's uh, it's been an absolute joy and a privilege. Thanks, Matt. I've, I've really enjoyed it. Thanks for the invitation. Oh, it's been great. What a great conversation. Huge thanks again to Andrew for joining me today. And also, don't forget, today's show sponsor, Orion Media. If you're wondering if podcasting is a good marketing strategy for your business, check out their website because I'm convinced it will be. Uh, orionmedia.com, that's A-U-R-I-O-N media.com. We will, of course, link to Orion uh, along with uh, a link to the Antarctic Science Foundation, along with a link to Andrew's uh, LinkedIn profile, all of that sort of stuff uh, on our website too, pushtobemore.com. Um, and you can find all of this information there as well. So be sure to follow Push To Be More wherever you get your podcasts from because We've got some more fantastic conversations lined up and I don't want you to miss any of them. And in case no one has told you yet today, uh, dear listener, uh, let me be the first. Uh, you are awesome. Yes, you are. It's just a burden you have to bear. And uh, Andrew has to bear it. I have to bear it. You've got to bear it too. We're awesome people. So Push To Be More is produced by Aurea Media. You can find our entire archive of episodes on your favorite podcast app. The team that makes this show possible is Sadaf Bainon, Josh Catchpole, Estella Robin, and Tim Johnson. Our theme music was written by Josh Edmondson. And as I mentioned, if you would like to read the transcript or show notes, head over to the website pushtobemore.com where coincidentally, you can also sign up for our weekly newsletter and get all of this good stuff direct to your inbox Box, totally free. So that's it from me. That's it from Andrew. Thank you so much for joining us. Have a fantastic week. I'll see you next time. Bye for now.